Okay. So, um, in getting going here, uh, what I wanted to do was look you know, introduce the, the panel for, for a roadmap discussion. And if we remember back where we were in Paris last year, uh, this is the point where we had a really good discussion about where we wanted to go. And where we wanted to go was to merge you know, functionality from uh, all the different uh, code branches into a single code base so that we can move forward. That's what we accomplished over the past year. We, we did really well doing that. It was a great measurable objective to achieve. And our challenge is, is to do that again. What is our roadmap for the next 12 months as a community? And I've heard a couple of key themes echoing throughout the meeting. Um, one of the, you know, is I think put uh, very eloquently by, uh, by Jan Willem, uh, we really need to focus on growing the user base and the community base. You know, that is really critical to where we are today, is, is growing that effort. In terms of the issues and doing that, there are a couple of key themes that have come through, and I'm going to ask the, the panel to, to hit on each of these, is, you know, there's an issue of content. Uh, I think the platform is there. Um, it, it's a terrific thing, but what is going to drive people to come to this is the content that can be deployed on the platform. You know, Ken has come with, with Michael J. Fox is really leading the way in bringing a lot of this content to the platform, but how can we continue to facilitate that, make that happen? Second thing I've heard is using Transmart as that middleware layer to facilitate the development of knowledge portals. I've heard the knowledge portal word echo throughout the hall and throughout different Transmart adopters. How do we make that more, the data more accessible to, to end users? So I want to hear a little bit about that. Training, uh, I think that's a big thing that's been echoing here. The foundation is starting out with a training program that we're putting in place. Uh, but I think training is really key, and uh, that's a key part of the roadmap for the next year that we're already starting on uh, today at this meeting. And then finally, growing the community. How do we continue to grow this community to get beyond you know, this very rich set of, of enthusiastic and passionate early adopters you know, to the more mainstream uh, adopters and, and end users of the platform? So these are things that the panel will focus on. Um, I think a few of you guys have a, a few comments you'd like to make. Brian, would you like to, to start? Oh, yeah. I and I'll see a... if uh, Alex can come in and, and get us set up with the slides. First of all, we're not interested in a lot of uh, just PowerPoint blabber. I mean, we just got a few points. We want to open this up to a discussion and ultimately address these points and achieve the um, success that we did in Paris, which was got a good roadmap that kept us going for a long time. And uh, so that we'll keep this brief and to the point. Uh, you know, and then we'll just race through these lists that Keith had um, mentioned, which I think are quite relevant. Okay, um, you know, shifting from a development, a primary development focus to an application use focus. We've got 1.2 now. Two now, it was really a heroic effort in a lot of ways. And, you know, Jay, I thought, spoke eloquently about the feature set, which is quite rich. And so that can be perfected. And now it's time to really, um, all of us, use that and, uh, and, and then publish and then uh, demonstrate the value of that because it's really a cut above uh, 1.0 and 1.1. Uh, and uh, it really defines the platform, redefines it in a way that's sensible. I have more questions, more um, comments um, directed towards I2B2 in this in a minute. Um, so, so those are those two points. Um, oh yeah, the content. And you know, uh, we augmented the content committee uh, group with um, Julie Bryant's addition, and she's been enormously helpful already. We've got to generate energy and focus there. Yesterday at the content committee meeting, we uh, developed four working groups, each of which have near-term deliverable objectives that can be met. And uh, this is absolutely key. We've known from the beginning, I mean, if you go back to the history of this, you know, with this uh, pre-competitive uh, data sharing with Johnson & Johnson and AstraZeneca in the very beginning, uh, really kind of motivated the IMA project in the first place, uh, it was uh, thought to be that the content was going to be the attractor. It's time to make good on that. We have over 60 data sets now that are uh, available to us. They need to be appropriately um, documented, reviewed, placed in the um, appropriate knowledge management context and make available through uh, platforms that we have. And then partner with others like um, uh, Michael J. Fox, to, uh, and, you know, and I'll mention a few other examples. Um, this is near-term stuff. Um, 
you know, I, I just make this point. I want to make sure that everybody knows that the foundation does have some funds. This is a member organization. We're growing that. One thing we had from the board meeting was that, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of support for this. The board is very much on our side and wants to help us. So if there has to be investments that are made, you know, we have more and more partners all the time. We can focus those investments. It doesn't all have to be for free. That's all. If we have a very, you know, kind of well-defined plan with deliverables, there can be some investments and the foundation can help with that. Um, you know, the user interface uh, certainly still needs work. And, uh, you know, that could, um, that could be a back and forth between community and uh, code. Kay's got some good ideas there and I know others do. Jay mentioned it. Um, I think one of the things that's very important for us is to work with communities at scale. Michael J. Fox is an example. Uh, you know, they, they funded $450 million of research projects so far. They have a big portfolio. It's growing. Uh, you know, that was the vision that Keith had for CHDI that got this conversation going in the first place. We can do this. Uh, I want to call out uh, Reagan Udall and Nancy Beck is here. There is an important project that's launching that involves, uh, I don't know how many, at least six or seven pharma companies, the FDA, several other partners, that is addressing this, um, this problem of um, you know, using um, TKI inhibitors, drugs, and seeing cardiotoxic effects, which are adverse events, and, you know, and building a, a data safety warehouse with Reagan Udall's leadership and the FDA and a, a number of pharma companies, other partners, including the Transmark Foundation. This is an opportunity to do something at scale. We have several partnerships with academic uh, health centers here in the United States that are either establishing or to be established, Harvard Medical School, University of Michigan, Hopkins, Chicago's interested. We of course have Etrix, which is moving to a phase now where the Luxembourg Group and the group, uh, you know, from Charles O'Frey, uh, you know, are going to, you know, start to exercise and use this platform in various ways. Uh, you know, and then again, the uh, key not-for-profit partnerships uh, in a new class of, of partners that Michael J. Fox exemplifies. And there are others. Um, and then lessons learned from I2B2. To begin with, you know, we, the good news is that I2B2 and its leadership, uh, you know, which would be Zach Kahani and uh, Sean Murphy and Susan Churchill and, uh, you know, our young uh, Paul. You know, these guys are committed to working with us and there is a way, especially with the API, which is improving, to um, leverage the features going forward with I2B2. The, the idea here is, look, I2B2, you know, in its next uh, version is, uh, you know, been funded by BD2K. There's money there. And Zach has indicated his willingness to uh, have a deep partnership right now with funding uh, to uh, bring Transmart along in a partnership ride. I mean, he told that to Gil and I right in my office, and he's committed to that. He sees the value. The dream all along was to have the molecules, which we had with the NCIBI, and the, the phenotypic information from I2B2. This is why we got into Transmart in the first place. And, you know, it's all coming together, and Harvard is committed to this, and we can work with them, and we can learn from them especially on this top-down, you know, ontologically informed BWAS that has to then, uh, you know, allow us to reorganize the molecular data in a way that's interpretable, which is really what uh, Paul was talking about, uh, you know, in his talk. And then this is a key piece. Listen, if we don't publish papers in, in, in peer-reviewed journals and publish our data in peer-reviewed venues and get DOI numbers on this and get credibility, we're lost, at least to the academic sector. Uh, Ike mentioned this. This is obvious. We have all have uh, actually studies that we're doing. Uh, the foundation itself has a responsibility not only to publish when it's appropriate to publish, uh, but uh, to, um, as part of its content mission, to pull together those publications in a way. You know, it's not that hard. You just type into PubMed and we can see it. But, you know, uh, especially if we want uptake from the academic sector, we better get real with that one. And, you know, I had a great talk with Brian uh, at Sanofi uh, Pasteur yesterday and others, and I happen to know that the pharma, so he was describing how, describing how, at least in Sanofi Pasteur with the vaccine program, uh, you know, there's a, new, there's a new guy in town, L.S. Rooney, and, you know, there's bonuses associated to publishing in peer-reviewed journals for the folks that are in pharma. You know, the world's changing that way in some very interesting ways where Transmark could play a big role. And so what we have to do, of course, is come up with, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, detailed, lightweight, doable action plans around content, around uh, the knowledge management portal and not getting mixed up in the middleware debates, training at all levels, not just uh, user training, but how about the graduate students and the future PhDs and MD PhDs and clinician scientists leadership? The idea that we have a concierge that's doing all the typing while the researcher sits in his office on the phone is ridiculous. We need to use this stuff. And community growth. I think uh, it has to be organic. With some, it's community growth, is, this is organic growth. Uh, you know, but we cannot just preach to the choir. We have to demonstrate examples more broadly in the community and let others take notice. And I know they will. And so that's the summation of my comments. Great. Good job. Brian, that's a great intro in, in framing of some of the issues. Uh, Case, did you have uh, some slides that you wanted to use to frame the issues as well? So we'll bring those up um, as we do that. I think that uh, you know one of the key things that I want to emphasize, and I'd love to get feedback from, from the panel and from the community is as we try to push forward on these various initiatives, what are the measurable objectives? How can we look back a year from now and say that we've accomplished this? Case? Oops, that's, that's a hard one. Um, I'm gonna park that a little bit. Oh my God. I'm posing that to everyone as we go, <laughs> but I'll, I'll let you. <laughs> that's so, um, <laughs> no, the Hive as a commercial uh, provider, software provider, what can we do or what can we have to say about the Transmart Roadmap um, is one question. And I think the answer to that is, is nothing, um, may, but maybe also everything. Um, it all depends on um, what customers we have and uh, what they tell us to do, right? That's it's very obvious. Um, but we are fortunate enough to have um, one very large project, one very large sponsor, which is the CTMM Trade Project. And um, those are the kind of projects, Trade and Etrix, where we can really work on fundamental developments of Transmart, um, at least at the moment. And I think that Transmart Foundation can probably also play a role more in that um, going forward. Um, but what I put up here is the trade roadmap. Um, you cannot read it, it's intentional. It's just showing how much of the um, um, goals in trade we have. And most of this is some way or another related to Transmart. Um, I have also a slide where you can read it. So I try to summarize um, from our perspective, and that's mainly from projects like trade where we can do fundamental developments. Um, it's actually not so easy to convince a pharma company to fund uh, development, but it has been done. And uh, I think Sanofi project is the best example of where we really did fundamental work and where Sanofi put in a lot of testing effort and um, had added some great improvements to Transmart. Uh, but obviously there is numerous other examples. Johnson um, and Johnson and Kirk and Elmer. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, you know, with the spot buyer. Um, yeah, the rest for API, so I, I don't need to go to all these, but I, what I try to do is summarize both from a trade perspective and also from what I see um, being uh, done uh, in, uh, in pharma companies and, and other um, communities that what, what do I see as feasible things to do that could get funded in the next year, right? Okay, that's how I made this list. And the first thing is, um, and this is a consensus we reached in this meeting, I think I'm very happy about that, that um, we really need to do something about the architecture of Transmart. This is a very fundamental point. Um, I, I don't want to go into details now, but I think the headline is that the more modular, the more decoupled the system is, uh, you saw also in the talk from Open Clinica, the more that will enable an exponential growth of the community. Because if we restrict the um, uh, development of the core of Transmart to a small community of people, and then um, that in itself doesn't really have to be a problem. Uh, but if we do not enable others to easily jump in without having to go through, you know, three months of learning how all the Transmart code bases work, etc., um, but only really having an API, 
um, and they could develop something, then Transmart can grow much faster than with the development community that we have today. And I think everyone recognizes that. So um, bringing out these APIs, helping other people to develop plugins, to develop modules, um, that is, I think, for me, is one of the core focuses next year. Especially since now we have established Transmart 1.2. It has a ton of functionality. There's lots of things you can do with it. Um, but for the development community, it's time to take a step back and reorganize some things in order to guarantee the sustainability of this platform. Very good. Okay, that's, that's the first thing. Um, second, I think it's very important to realign with I2B2, and uh, Paul Aviak also um, showed us how he is using Transmart. And um, I already talked to Paul, and, and we're going to find ways to um, get uh, the group at Harvard fully aligned with the development of Transmart 1.2 and also uh, going forward. The third point, um, Transmart is a very pragmatic approach. It's a killer application for translational research. And maybe one of the reasons is because it's so simple. You know, people can understand it. It has this tree. Um, it's a fixed tree. It's one way to um, index your data, one way to look at your data, and you can already um, do a lot with that approach. And the ETL is another example. Um, the source format for the ETL is very pragmatic. I'll get into the pipeline itself later. Um, but these kind of choices are good and is what helps you set up Transmart fast. But it also comes at an expense. Transmart is not really flexible in looking at multiple ways at the same data. And the search and browse interface um, helps a little bit with that. But still, I think this is also a point where we need some developments because um, we did several projects with pharma companies where we did a pilot and then the evaluation outcome was, well, it's a nice tool, but it's not flexible enough for a cross-trial um, genomics um, uh, experiments. So I do think that's something that we want to invest in. The fourth is... Um, Transmart could use better visualizations in the uh, yeah. omics space, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. We have, for example, CBioPortal, which is a great tool um, to quickly visualize um, multi-omics data. It has all the TCGA data loaded in it. Go to cbioportal.org, you can play with it. I'm trying to find ways to get them aligned with Transmart, so I'm going to New York tomorrow to talk with Sloan Kettering to see how we can um, get them uh, yeah. aligned with Transmart. The fifth thing is, um, this is important for trade. It's um, how can we connect Transmart better with imaging? It's also an yeah. important topic in uh, eTrix. What we would like to do is somehow have um, a software like XNAT, which can um, process DICOM, extract the metadata, and it also allows you to run um, pipelines on the imaging data. Um, and the Loney pipeline is another example there. Yeah. <coughs> we want that somehow um, coupled to Transmart so that you can at least see the annotations but also click through to see the actual images. And uh, since I think the trait is, is uh, run, um, we saw uh, with the talk from Gerrit Meyer. He's a pathologist, so it's obviously um, for the PI of trait, this is an important topic. And also with the academic medical centers involved. Then the sixth that we have here is um, ETL. Um, my development team is not very happy with the current ETL on Transmart. And I'm not the only one. We saw a presentation from Tom's Reuters. Um, they had also a couple of remarks there. It's clear that we need to work on that. And I'm looking to, for ways to, um, together with Tom's Reuters and others, to improve this pipeline, to make it much more flexible, and also um, to allow that content repository that Brian uh, showed to be enabled by the ETL. Ideally, you go to a website, um, you see all the data that's available, you click which ones you have, and you click load, and it just goes into Transmart. And actually, the software that we have today, um, including Transmart data, already uh, has a lot of technical abilities that allow you to do that. Um, so that you might want to look into that if you, you are doing ETL. Um, 
and that's also covering the last point, data sharing. Then there's one more, um, and this is a more fundamental discussion. Transmart is a data warehouse. So what we do is um, you take the data from everywhere, whether that's clinical or imaging data or genomics data, RNA-seq, microarray, you name it, and you put it all into one big database in Oracle or Postgres. Now, I have a genomics um, expert on my team, and um, the first time when I got him into a transmit project, he was saying to me, why the hell are you ETLing VCF files into an Oracle <laughs> database? Where did you come from? Um, and then he made this picture. In what he thinks, um, that's Wim Spey, what Wim thinks that the Transmart uh, storage structure should look like. Yeah. Um, and so one of the key elements here is the genome analysis toolkit from the broad. If you look into um, so open source well, pipelines, yeah. the ones that are used by Sanger, by Broad, mm -hmm. etc., but also by even commercial tools like Gene Data, all of them have, um, or many of them have, at heart, an open source tool called uh, GATK. It's developed yeah. by Broad Institute. Um, it's dual licensed, but the key piece of the architecture, which is a piece that allow you to have um, storage of BAM, SAM, VCF, uh, BCF files um, on any, uh, on Hadoop or a file system or wherever, and you can have an API which then allows you to walk through the sequence data. That piece of GATK is actually open source. Yeah. So Wim um, asked me, can we do a project where we change Transmart such that this um, GATK interface becomes the basis of um, any genomic information that comes into Transmart, rather than trying to do um, uh, load all the VCF files into the database. So I thought it was an interesting question. I'm now going to try and find a sponsor that uh, allows us to do this. Yeah, this, this is a good case. Um, it is consistent with the Global Alliance for the Sharing of Genomic and Health Data. This is exactly what they're doing. So that spec is laid out in their, uh, in their white paper. So that's good. I mean, we want to leverage that. So I, I think that's terrific. Okay, um, so I'll shut up now. But <laughs> these are my uh, points I would like to, yeah, to work on next year. Uh, yeah, you have I a few do, things for us? I do have a few slides. Um, so um, just to start, um, I... I'm from Sanofi, and I'm the user lead, um, science, scientific lead for the Transmart project internally. So I, what I'm going to speak is really coming from the user's perspective. And um, what I want to start with is just say how Transmart is used at Sanofi. So what we view, San, uh, what we view Transmart is really a data, data warehouse, data repository. That's where, um, you know, where the data is. Okay, this is the fundamental functionality for for Transmart. And, and this was unique about Transmart is you can not only put, say, not only the clinical, also the, the, um, the genomic data on the transcriptomic, also proteomic, multi-omic um, data that can actually reside in there, which is a very unique function of Transmart. I don't know any, um, I don't, I'm not very aware of other systems can really mash up these multi-omic data um, based on patient individual individual at individual level other ones they might you know in, uh, mash up as a gene level or protein level you know, that kind of you know. so it's really a, a data repository for for multi omic and um, clinical and uh, research data all together and then we have these you know three sort of main piece on top of search and browse analyze um, which most of people call data explorer uh, and also the art api um, again, we, I want to stress we have two distinctive population of users. Um, this is representative of the, the research scientists, and what they will use is um, the, the search and browse to find the relevant, you know, I'm studying on some diseases, maybe there are some relevant information in the repository that I can use already. So this is to find the relevant studies. Um, I can also generate some hypothesis using the simple um, interface, using the, the analyze or data uh, explorer. 
um, to generate. Uh, this is really single data study data um, export and also in, in understanding of exploratory analysis based on single study. Um, but we also have some uh, expert users, so th those are informaticians. And what they will do is they they will find they want to find um, some relevant study. This is also a functionality that they will use. But also they will primarily use the R API. To be honest, they want to retrieve data, relevant data, but not only one study, but batch data export, multivariate analysis, and cross study, or so called metadata analysis. And um, this type of analysis, I think, is reflected also in case talk in terms of um, advanced genomic analytical capabilities, cross-study analysis. We are doing mostly in our environment. Obviously, that's not the best uh, user interface for, for that kind of an analysis. Um, so, so the requirements will really come, come down later. So this is sort of a summary of every what's going on in, in Sanofi. Um, the, you know, the, the key element that we really liked, obviously, is a lot of the data support, um, microRNA, proteomic, and uh, other ones is really fantastic. Um, and the other ones, I, I'm not going to go over all, all the, the details. But going looking forward, I really want to say this it's a value proposition for users base to guide the roadmap. So what I think is the first is really we have to have a, the system itself has to have a robust performance itself make it do really, really well what it can do right now. It don't have all these different sort of small quirkiness happening here and there. Um, so I have a whole bunch of, in terms of say system debugging, tuning, making sure the performance, this is technical performance. Also in terms of functionality performance also has to be really robust. It's, it works as a way user expect to do. It's not, it doesn't work as um, say developer <laughs> thinks the way it is, and that we often get into this, you know, conversation in terms of it's a bug or it's a function, you know, functionality um, re new requirements. To me, if something does not function as the way that the user expect, it's a bug. Okay, it, it's <laughs> I don't want to go into more discussion on that one. Um, so the next one is the data. I don't want to say these two things is sort of, this is the most critical and this is the secondary. I think these are equal, equally uh, critical. So data is really the currency in, you know, among scientists. I think Magali's talk when people ask her what's the you know, most difficult for, for her, for the Orion project that she encountered, she's actually say it's data sharing you know, from convincing scientists to share data. And data is really the critical, the blood in, in translational research. So um, what we can do for Transmart is really making the data model, making it really um, fits the translational research, whatever it's, what's doing now, and also anticipate the new analytical needs, right? Um, making sure that this is the go-to. Hello? So, Transmart to become the go-to platform for curated public data. Right now, there are multiple public data repositories, but they are not really functioning as an uh, analysis-ready data repository. So I think this is where a very sweet spot Transmart can play. Um, and getting data in and out, we you know we have the functionality right now, but. Uh, it, it doesn't, it, some, sometimes it doesn't getting the, we cannot get the data specifically data set out. It's, um, it has some you know, issues in there as well. Um, Community-based curation effort for public data, I think, uh, and this is really going the next step um, from you know, what's, this is looking into what's out there right now and this is really going forward, say, can we work together and then curate public data together? That, that's another um, um, effort that I think is really will be very valuable to, to for the user community. And on top of these two elements, I think then we can think of advanced functionality. Um, and some of these things, actually advanced functionality, like Kay's already mentioned, there's, there's already out there. Other systems, Array Studio, CBio Portal, um, Gene Data, these are really advanced data analytical um, systems. Why don't we leverage it? And some of the, you know, spa fires and other ones. So we, we should have like really strength. I agree with the, the API approach, really strengthening that part and making the connector really function well. And then that way we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, and then, you know, and we also talked about, I think that in terms of the developer community, specifically focusing on Transmart, 
maybe we can think of these you know, additional really innovative and high-valued uh, visualization and analytical capability that's not really avail available out there. And that make it, this is something unique for Transmart. Again, and even though maybe those functionality may not be bulletproof proof right from the very beginning, but because it's new, it's, it's innovative, it's, it's uh, unique, then you know, user will still be attracted to it. So these are pretty much my um, sort of the, the, um, the summary of the entire thing. I have some you know, details um, we don't have to go through right now, I think, so. Great. Okay, thank you, Shen. That's great. Um, I think that really sets the framework. What I'd like to do. Uh, Ken might have a few comments. Yeah, Ken, do you want to have an oh, introduction? Sure, I mean, uh, I think that uh, there's been a lot said about the architecture. I'm, I'm kind of I'm new to, to Transmart, but um, uh, I'm not new to software deployment and enter enterprise deployments. And um, to grow this community, there are just three basic um, uh, truths in order to do this. It's like basically you got to push deployments, education, and ease of use. And in deployments, um, you know, when you go to, I, I just, I just uh, took a, uh, went to a workshop on, on big data analytics, and I, I was amazed. You know, uh, they didn't ask us, they didn't have a, a work terminal set up for us. They just said, bring your laptops. And we brought in our laptops, and they go, okay, you all have AWS accounts. Let's bring up a node. Now you're going to bring up 10 racks. Yeah. Right? And all of a sudden, I had a Hadoop cluster yeah. myself in one afternoon running MapReduce, right, and dealing with terabytes of data. I know there's people from uh, British Telecom here. Who, who are they? Anyone? Oh, they left. Well, I, you, know, I, I, you know, just thinking out of the top of my head, is, like, is there any way we could, we could approach uh, Amazon Web Services or British Telecom to have ready-made instances of Transmart Ready? And then, uh, you know, in academia, uh, I know that a good third of the people who download our observational trial data are instructors who are teaching you know, yeah. uh, medical informatics. And so uh, what a great combination. You create a SKU with Amazon Web Services or British Telecom yeah. and say, here's, a, here's an e educational SKU. You could bring up your own instance of Transmart yeah. and upload these publicly available data sets and then you have your next generation of bioinformaticists that know Transmart inside and out, and they, they join the community, yeah. right? So that's a, this is like a IT Pro Sustained Marketing 101, <laughs> you know? Excellent. Uh, right, so uh, that's what I'm thinking. And then, of course, you know, my feet are to the fire, as I mentioned last night. We're going to roll out our RFA uh, with ADNI and PPMI data on Transmart and ease of use is going to be key. So we're going to be uh, heads down on creating a splash page, you know, so people who enter in our RFA can go in and quickly learn the basics. So this is going to be a really good learning. This is information I'm going to disseminate to all of, all of you. I don't expect it. I expect, I don't expect it's going to be painless. I think it's going to be very painful, but, um, I think the future upside is worth it. So, this is where I'm. Terrific. That, that's great advice. Um, I do know that, that from the, the BT perspective, they have what they call a click to deploy for, for Transmart. Oh, great. Um, although it's an empty version, uh, it might be better to have it as a, a populated version so people could actually get in and, and, and work with a lot of data right out of the box. Uh, we have talked, <clears throat> talked in the past with Amazon. It's been harder for us to get some of their attention for that, but I, I think we can go back and revisit that, you know. You know given that it's, we've had 12 months go by now. Excellent. Well, um, I think as, as we all, well, as many of us know, and we sat here in Paris um, and went through the, the roadmap for the next year, it was actually a pretty straightforward roadmap, and we prioritized features and did that. I got that together. One of the reasons we put this discussion in the morning is one of the critiques we had last time is that a number of people had left by the time we were having that discussion. I wanted to make sure that as many people could be here for this as we could, we could have. So uh, we've done that. But what I'd like to do is open this up um, to discussion and really you know, focus on some of the themes that we've gotten. And let's, let's get the feedback from the community where the priorities are. You know, what we have is, is a very limited amount of resource and, and time. 
uh, where should the foundation and the foundation management team be focusing you know, our time and efforts in helping this community achieve its goals and objectives over the next 12 months? So let me open it up. Um, Gil? So uh, these were terrific comments and sufficient specificity to really make a work plan for the coming year. Uh, Brian highlighted the importance of publications, and especially in the academic sphere and in some companies. That's great. But I'd like to uh, speak to the more practical side of this and the priorities probably for the companies, which is to show the use of these resources and these collaborative approaches makes a difference so that a, a product development is accelerated, that there are uh, uh, not just testimonials, but product advances and, and uh, real value generated by bringing uh, a candidate into humans through the path toward an IND delivery to the regulatory agencies and benefit for patients. It's a multi-year process, of course, but uh, Michael J. Fox wants acceleration. Companies all need acceleration. And we need to be able to show that this kind of analysis and this kind of sharing of data and people coming together and interacting, as you have here for these three days, makes a difference. Um, publications are fine. But I can tell you the story of one of our major benefactors here at the University of Michigan, very successful businessman and mathematician named Bill Brem whose wife has been living with uh, type 1 diabetes for more than 60 years with um, no significant end organ complications. A smart man, he wants to know why that is in contrast to all the large majority of patients who are suffering or deceased because of end organ complications within 30 years. So he met with people here and built a consortium around the country, a very hands-on philanthropist. He told us he respected our priorities and metrics of papers, graduates, and grants. But he wasn't that interested. Yeah. What he wanted were results, a cure for type 1 diabetes, or improved care for patients. And I think in the end, that's what we're all really aiming for, is benefits to patients and populations. And we should be able to make that mark. But it comes faster if it's a stated, explicit goal and if we reach across to each other and uh, recognize the advances and promote the recognition of those uh, advances wherever they occur, but especially among our member organizations. Thank you. Yeah. Great, thanks, Gil. Good comments. Anyone else? I would pick on Dan, but I see he's on the phone, so. <laughs> so here, here's one of the things that uh, Ken and I were talking about last night um, to, to some of Gil's efforts. Um, I know in working with, uh, with CHDI, uh, one of the, the kind of concepts that, that people had there was that if we could just get the data out there in a form that people could work with, that somebody out there is going to find something that's actionable and interesting. Um, how do we make that happen? And one of the things that I've thought about in terms of, of a roadmap for us along the content side is, you know, we've, we've been pretty successful in bringing together people for hackathons and doing code merging and code development. We're going to hear about the results of our hackathon uh, over this the course of this meeting uh, this afternoon. Hopefully great stuff is there. We're going to get a demo, right, Jay? A live demo, just like Paul does? Okay. <laughs> um, uh, we've also had, you know, some very good results with testathons, getting people out there to use the platform, work on the platform, report bugs. Uh, one of my thoughts was, and I'd like to get feedback from the community here, is what about some sort of analysis-a-thon, where we come in with a data set loaded up on a platform, very much like you were saying with your big data, you know, workshop. You know, fire up your Hadoop and your MapReduce, and everything is there, and we bring together a people, a group of people in the same room. And we see exactly what we can do with the data set. Yeah. Any thoughts? Any reaction? I'm sorry? A data Well, we could do a, I think that there are a lot of competitions out there like Dream and whatnot, which I think are interesting. Um, I'm not, not sure how successful they are. I look at, 
what we've been successful in doing is pulling things together. I would rather see a paper published or you know, some result found that we could would have an impact on a program. Julie? I think we're going to see that coming up. So I was t telling you about Janssen. So they've um, made some um, progress using Transmart um, in the area of Chrome's. And that's going to be reported in Q4. So we, we couldn't announce it here, but they're, they're going to do a big announcement. And so you'll see that. And um, I'll try and see if we can make sure that Transmart gets the due credit on that as well. And that, but I think a lot of the pharma ha are having successes. It is making a difference, and they they are using it for patient stratification. They are using it for biomark biomarkers and that, and to um, delineate patients. So it definitely is making progress. It's just it's slow and coming out, coming out to the public. And going back to your point about content, I think we you know we do need to get content in there. And there's a lot of data out there. It's easy to curate. It's not expensive to curate. And I'll cover that in some of my slides that we can easily do that. We can, as I've said before, we share the costs. As long as people agree that it can go in the public domain, it can be curated and got out there at really quickly at a reasonable price. And I think once we do that, then more discoveries have made. And I know at Jingo, we did that with Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. And we put a lot of things in the public domain. And then GSK put a program together that they didn't have before because they repurposed a drug and that. So I think if we just make it easier for people, we'll have more success and find cures faster, which I think most of us are in the room working for that end goal. Great. Excellent. Well, I think getting more publications and more data out there is an amazing Keith, thing to do. Um, from my perspective, what you just mentioned, the awesome. uh, hackathon datathon concept, yeah. I think it's great. Yeah. I think it's, I mean, from, from my narrow foundation point of view, that would just be uh, spectacular. You know, just getting, Maybe we could get some uh, uh, thought leaders from the field of Parkinson's disease and come out with the questions as challenges and bring in, bring in the best of the best in terms of clinical informatics people and have a data fest on the, on the platform. And what if we could do that? Put together sort of a three-day data fest with scientists, clinicians, developers, all working on a common data set and then come out and publish the result. <laughs> we, I, doesn't that sound like a good idea? Yeah. Yes? How many people think that's a good idea? How many people would participate in that kind of an effort? Mm -hmm. More hands, come on. Excellent. I mean, I think that would be a great thing to do. And it sounds like, you know, we could certainly work with Michael J. Fox to, to do something like that. You've got data that you're putting out. Parkinson's, I think, would be a really relevant space. And it might even, it might even induce uh, groups to share their data. Yep. Right. This is this is like is like a very symbiotic kind of a thing. It's it's like we get answers, accelerated answers, kind of like a data yeah. Manhattan day, yeah. you know. And then and then and then other groups see this incredible advantage that the people get who actually share their data because yeah. they get answers, and then they share data and they. Well, we could create a very virtuous circle. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if we were to do something like that, who would, who would we recruit to organize? I see one hand. Who absolutely. else would, would, would want to help out with putting some sort of data fest hackathon together? Yeah. All the guys all here, actually. <laughs> okay. Well, it's an obvious stuff I'm going to put you guys all on the hook. I, I love that idea. Piece, yeah, piece, yeah. I mean, I think know, it's a, a big it'd be great force accelerant. multiplier in this thing. And we could, you know, we could look at doing maybe a couple of themed kind of events. One maybe around Parkinson's. You know, I don't it know. It could be across Ryan neurological could diseases. It could be across oncological diseases. Yeah. 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 It'd be fantastic. Well, I think we could put together a program of maybe a couple of those over the next twelve months. Would be really that would be a nice measurable as well. You know, pulling people together, executing those, and actually having some write up of results. Um, Keith, so in addition to your um, data data thon or data analytics thon, whatever you call it, idea, um, on the data, on the content front, can we think of, as a community, think, identify a couple of public data sources that um, that's really mutually useful for everyone and um, yep. see can we put into Transmart becoming available for everyone? So what would you recommend? Do you have a suggestion? <laughs> Um, you know, there's, 
there, there's a, a few I think neurological disease was mentioned before. So there's mm -hmm. a we can even think of say you know putting all the subset of a geo neurological disease or in there, or um, there's uh, we can identify a couple data sets coming from DB Gap. I think it could be a little tough. Well, Brian, but, um, I, you, you've been involved with One Mind. I know they have their track TBI. Is that something that's publicly available? Absolutely, and you know there is funded work. I mean, we've got a grant with those guys. Yeah, so I mean, was, yeah uh, we can certainly identify. Group, uh, yeah. One Mind for Research, I think, would be very interested, and of course, they're uh, largely interested in uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, traumatic brain injury, and uh, things that have affected uh, the returning war fighters. And uh, yeah. You know, yeah, we, we so, could definitely bring those guys in. So I think yeah. there's probably a couple of data sets around neurodegenerative yeah, disease. Yeah, I think neurodegenerative disease in general there would be really a, interesting. There's a grant yeah. that Jeff Manley, I think you know that Jeff Manley at the University of California, San Francisco, who is a um, brain Who do we have? Uh, neurosurgeon, brain, brain person, TBI expert, has the track, to, track TBI program. He's the PI of it. One Mind is basically the host of that. Uh, you know, as a member of their scientific advisory board, founder, I, I, I think we could do it. Okay. <laughs> you know, and it's an obvious thing. And so we'll make a little email introduction between Ken and, and Garen and uh, uh, General Chiarelli. Uh, Let's make this happen. After lunch. Yeah. It's yeah. your idea. That's why this man is the CEO of the foundation. Yeah, there you go. So, so one comment I'd make. Thanks. At, preferring to go to more autoimmune or something like that, because I think neurodegenerative is, is good, but when you look at growing the community, um, a lot of farmers have dropped those kind of programs. So there's more in... You know, all the more oh, reason. It has to turn around, because yes. we're All the more reason, and Hussein Imanji at j, &J is, uh, who runs neuroscience, we know them member well. of uh, the Institute of Medicine, is expressing his strong interest in transplant. Well, that has worked <laughs> Deal, but crumbling at the seams. So I think they're, it's actually turning around as we speak. Um, so that's why it might be a good area. Actually. Yeah, agree, agreed, but there's, there's, I think if you well, want to build the community, there's more in order. Yeah, there's some neat stuff coming. Excellent. Ketamine, Norax is a new startup that's uh, t taking a lot of interest there. So it's MDMA. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's stuff happening in that. So let, let me let me put out to the audience. Okay, so we have a few groups here interested in neurodegeneration, which I think would be great with Michael J. Fox kind of leading the way. So in terms of autoimmune or, or inflammatory disease, is there anybody here who'd like to suggest a sort of datathon, right hackathon? Oh, you can Jay? Imagine, no. yeah. Definitely. Yeah, this is, this is great. So my selfish selfish nature, this is great because the organization I work for is certainly interested in neurodegenerative diseases as well as autoimmune. So uh, I'm not sure I'm necessarily the right person, to, but I can bring that back to our organization. I really would hope that there's there's real interest. I mean, Solera, didn't Solera do this like with the Drosophila genome, right? When they had the mapping, they brought in all the, yeah, the best Drosophila workers and, and they got them together for three days and they put all their, their, their clone the, the genes they were cloning on the map of the, it was a pretty extraordinary. So I think it, part of it is planning on who, who you want to be involved, what data you really want to pull in that's going to be enabling for the specific folks so you can really make sure that you're, you're putting, pe you're positioning people in a, in a you're, you're putting this in, people in a position where they can really, uh, yeah, where, where, where the outcomes, where you really have a high probability of, of productive outcomes from it, and yeah, it's a wonderful idea, and you know, I'll Paul, do what I can with Pfizer. <laughs> Paul, with the neuro focus, you know, the autism spectrum say disorders autism. ought to be right in yeah. there. You yeah. can do a Love lot to, to definitely. Yeah. What's the no. All of them have specific and different data use agreements uh, with a very complex IB and multiple data use agreements. So. I would love to share that, but I can't because I... Uh, but the methodology, you know, there's other things that you could help us with. You know, at the data sharing, uh, you know, understanding that you've got studies underway, but some of the methodology that you're employing, you know, to understand, especially spectral disorders yeah. in the neuro, neuro, neurological Or maybe space. you could get, is it, maybe, is it possible you could get permission to release it just for the datathon? 
right? For the for the for this data hackathon, or you, or a certain you, you could limit it, data set that you could develop. But just you know, you it would it would it would want it wouldn't leave the premises. You know, they could ha they could ha hack on it, try to find solutions, um, in a in this limited space in this limited time frame. Well, the IBs are very specific about this. I. I I can't give one variable of one thing to someone who's not on the IRB or in the data user. Oh, oh, oh you mean consent? The consent? Yes, the, so, everything is consented. So I, I. Um, this is a very legitimate thing. Yeah, we no, can't no, have no, a discussion I, it's about not me, that. It's not me who's deciding. It's the IRB. So. Uh, so for, this is a, a, you know, a confounder, but something that we can work through in yeah. terms of patient consent and IRBs and all that I, kind of I stuff. I know, you know, in my experience at CHDI, we also had that patient consent issue. And for one particular study, you know, went back and very laboriously reconsented every patient. And then patients they couldn't get back to, they just pulled out of the data set. Well, I'll give I mean, you it's laborious. We, but, we do have some resources where we have consent for retrospective studies. For example, here at the University of Michigan, uh, we have something called the Prechter Bipolar Data Repository, where we have about 1,200 bipolar uh, patients, well annotated, uh, DNAs, uh, you know, sequence information, at least on exomes, and, uh, you know, lots of good history, longitudinal trajectories, greater than five years. You know, we put a lot of time and money into that, and that is a data set that can be looked at and mined and searched for in term and analyzed retrospectively. Then if you find something, you say you could, you know, we have the ability to reconsent patients, contact them, and so forth. So, you know, I just want to plant this in, in folks' minds that sometimes we can have uh, resources that can be um, looked at from a retrospective perspective that's actually quite valuable for this kind of, um, you know, and it doesn't run into the problems, Paul, that you're bringing up on the prospective side, which is more difficult because of those issues that you mentioned. Yeah. And I have one more comment about this. Um this, this mind share that we're having right now is, could it be that, Keith, you created this sandbox, mm -hmm. right? This data hackathon sandbox that says, you know, we get access to some data that's normally not made publicly available just for this venue. Mm -hmm. If you can, if, if that is something that's negotiable, right, with some, Holder, maybe even Pfizer, other pharmaceutical companies, that this is classified information. But but for the data thon, since everybody could benefit, then it could it could do two things. It could provide the 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 sourcers of the information valuable insights into their own data. Right. And two, it could provide a huge draw for the event. Yeah. Because then these data scientists finally get access to information that they never, never normally would be able you. to get access to. Yeah. It's a problem with data science, yeah. That, oh, you know, and you can bring the, access. I yeah, mean, but, but know, it could yeah. be a draw. It, it, but also think about bringing clinicians and data scientists together yeah. with developers that can immediately like modify the code specifically for an analysis. I mean, I, I, to me, that just sounds incredibly powerful. Yeah. I mean, what I what I think I'd like to do is is like commit the foundation to trying to do two of those in the next twelve months. I don't know. One one possibility maybe could also be to de-identify the data set, so anonymize totally the data set. So it depends what you want to do and what kind of data you have. But uh, that's also a possibility. Then you can freely uh, analyze it and share it. Absolutely. In fact, I think have you guys do you. Have, do you have, have you de-identified the data sets that you're working with or are those things that would have to be protected? No, all the data sets that we have are de-identified. So they're all de-identified themselves already. So, excellent. There's no problem from that perspective. There's still IRB issues, I think, uh, you know, to, to Paul's point. Oh, yes. What do we got? Are oh, you going to make me put on my glasses? Here you go. <laughs> I can't read it either. Gonna... Yeah. Okay, one of us is going to have to. Oh, I've got mine. Here we go. Okay. Would it be more impactful for patients and pharma to have data fest on some rare or ultra rare diseases? That's an interesting question. Uh, the, 
the issue with, I think at least the, the rare and ultra rare, um, the data availability is is more scarce than yeah. you know the well, other I, I think you're in. One of the things I've seen is with, with rare diseases and ultra rare diseases, you often have very well organized communities that have brought some of that data together. Not universally by any means, but you have pockets. You know, again, I think Huntington's disease is a good example where you have a foundation like CHDI that's, you know, organized patients and organized data and, you know, is characterizing things with large scale clinical trials. There are pockets of those uh, in the rare, yeah. rare and orphan diseases. But in general, I think you're absolutely right. Was there another question there? Okay. Okay. Another thing is the question of the rare and ultra rare is a little bit different from the question that you pose in the um, for you know the other disease types. Yeah, true, so. true, true. I mean, I like the the whole concept of organizing something around Parkinson's or even more generally neurodegeneration. Um, if we were to do a second one, we heard uh, Julie talk about um, autoimmune disease. Is there anyone here who would? stand up and say that they've got a particular area of interest that, with resources that we could actually do. I know Paul would love to do autism, but he's limited uh, by his IRB issues. Is there anyone else here that can, can volunteer? Yeah? We'll have to get oh, no, I'm, do you have any data set you can use? Yeah, right. What do you have? <laughs> Make, make sure everyone stays awake for which are hours. less interesting in the context because I don't have on those data set I didn't integrate them because I don't have patient level data and as you saw and everyone can use it the way he wants but uh, transplant but I, I I always want to put patient level data real patient level data thousands and thousands of variables per patient uh, so in all those cases, uh, I'm, I'm limited with a, a, an IAB issue. Well, here, yes. here, here's an idea then. I think, Brian, this sounds like a, a content committee working group. Yeah, I, I was, um, yeah. Uh, you know, it, with the, um, you know, ad hoc uh, nature of it, you know, focused on, you know, some short-term deliverables in the space. So, Julie, you, you know, and Sierra Mon, if you're still around, but Julie is, it's obviously fitting in within the wheelhouse of the content committee. And uh, however, you know, there are strong links with community and um, also code. I mean, there's no doubt about it because some things are gonna have to change all the way from getting the platform on BT or AWS and making it just right from the point of view of a good starting point that's accessible. And then, you know, get reaching out to uh, various community uh, elements here, but beyond to make sure that we are uh, working with partners like uh, Michael J. Fox to make sure, sure we've got the people showing up. Yeah. I was thinking one of the really pain points, I think uh, if you do data analysis, a number of us have looked at public data already, um, the data that's deposited in geodata, and we've even done some cross-study analysis, uh, meta-analysis on by ourselves. But what's lacking for those data sets is um, the phenotypic sites. It's very shallow. So if the foundation can actually make an effort to go to say the, the, um, the author, original author, and to say, can we actually enrich those, the, those data sets already on the clinical side? Mm -hmm. Then, you know, this really brings tremendous value to people where they already, they're very familiar with the data sets already. So they know the value to begin with already. And then if you can add this additional layer to them, they will be, I mean, they would be fantastic. True. Well, I think we've got a, a path forward there that sounds really interesting. It's, it's really exciting. I, I'm excited by that. Uh, in terms of other, other roadmap issues that we heard today from the group, Jay? Okay, so the code committee got together yesterday, and on our roadmap, we had two, honestly, very simple things, right? API development and ETL that came out. And now I'm, I'm looking here, and there's actually much more robust functionality that would be proposed. And you know, last year, we had very clear marching orders because we had a list. We yeah. had things that were already done. It was integrated. It was very clear what the code committee was going, well, what the, what the developers were going to do. And we don't have that this year. So the question is, how do we, how do we move forward? And, and, and Sherry's going to tell me, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> um, these are some of the things that we can start already. Um, these are certain things that we run into. You know, this, this, 
these are existing functionalities. Um, you know, some of things actually surfaced already when we were working with Hive. And one thing really, to me, very important is actually the, um, the you know, simple Z-score um, and um, normalization on the fly rather than the Z-score stored and calculated as soon when you import the data, which anyway, um, I think on the fly makes a lot of sense. Cohort selection enable high dimensional database cohort selection rather than right now you can only um, but the, for the continuous data, see, I want to say um, separate a cohort based on a, a specific genes expression level um, into, say, low, medium, and high. Right now, I can only do with the clinical data set, continued data points, but not the high dimensional data. Um, you know, it's things, I mean, these are just a starting points. So, anyway, I can supply with your list, definitely. On the data front, data model, um, data, data standard actually is another thing that we kind of touched upon and we, uh, we don't have time to. Data provenance this is also very important for us. Um, export and the connector, there's a number of things that we can you know, supply you with as well. So you know, these are just a starting and we should discuss Great. in the community you know, working group as well. No, I think we should. One of the things that we, we had, we took advantage of last year is that we have, number one, uh, a lot of features that were already developed uh, by individual collaborations. And then secondly, we had uh, developer resources coming from eTrix and from Trait that were specifically working on some of this integration. Um, I'll point out again that the foundation didn't actually write a line of code uh, in the last 12 months. It was really an entirely community-based effort. Uh, one of the questions going forward is when we have these new kind of feature sets, um, is there a way for the foundation to catalyze groups coming together to fund some of this activity? Um, and I think that's something we need to take on as well. Are there means for us to, to pull from the community some development um, priorities and then pull uh, some funds from that to fund the development effort and, and do some project management on that? What I learned over the last 12 months is what we could do really well as a foundation was product project and product manage. Um, and But we don't have any coding resources. That might be something we can do is pull together those, those requirements into a specific proposal, uh, bring some funding around that from the, the interested yeah. parties, and then uh, manage that project. So that's, what do you think? Reaction? And, and I'll ask Case to, 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 to see if I'm out of my mind, right? <laughs> do we, and I'm agnostic here, I'm just making an observation. We're open source. We're an open source community, and are we going to run our open source community in a manner that is we don't care about functionality because people will just do that for us, right? There'll be interested parties that'll do that for us, and we'll and it'll just emerge. Are we going to run the community? And I think we've done this in the past with a very where we're essentially running it like we would run a very you know a commercialized software. I, I'm, I'm hesitant to say commercialized, I'd say a managed software development where we have a life cycle and we have plans and here are the things we want and we're going to assign resources. And, and you know, I'm, we know that the, the, the latter can work, right? And maybe that's where we need to go. But I, I think we ought to talk about that a little bit because it does have an impact on how we, we manage the roadmap from the foundation in terms of how we expect contributions to be to be uh, consolidated into the system that we're that we're building. Jay, do you think those two dynamics are mutually exclusive? Uh, well, we know from Cal that they're not, right? We know from Cal that they're not, at least in, in Open Clinica, because I think there's a, and we were talking about what percentage is that of the code is actually provided by the community in ad hoc contribution versus the part that Open Clinica as the company manages and, uh -huh. and manages the roadmap. So I don't think they're mutually exclusive. I think there's there's clear indication, but. What was I, the fraction between the two, Jay? I think I remember, but Cal's gonna Cal, have to. Right. What was it just between the code base that's managed by Open Clinica versus this, this contribution of code from the community? Just, you know, just in terms of fractions, I would imagine that, you know, you control the majority of it, and then you have things changing on the end. Yeah, it is in terms of, uh, contributions that come in that are kind of de novo from the outside it's it's you know maybe 10 to 20 percent um, and uh, yeah most of it is kind of our priorities and 
uh, the, the prioritized list we maintain. We do most of the development and you know, others uh, will contribute you know, on the edges of that. Uh -huh. So that's a model that you see more with other open source projects, like if, for example, MongoDB and TenGen uh -huh. is an example. And it works well. I don't think Transmart is like that because there is not one company that does the majority of the Transmart developments. I mean, there are obviously some parties that contribute more than others, but um, in principle, this whole community is really transatlantic, first of all. Yeah. And second, um, it's really also divided over um, commercial and um, academic. Um, so, Transmart is from the start really a collaborative distributed development. And I would hate to see, you know, it, one company take all of that. Um, I think that the power of this community is in that distributed nature. Mm. I, I think that also the open source nature sparked discussions like we just had, which quite stunned me in a, in a positive way. It means that what we're doing here transcends just a software package. We're really looking for new ways to interact and to bring that open source mindset to even doing research, which is fantastic. But that, that, that as an aside, I haven't answered your question, Jay. Um, and it's a very difficult one. <laughs> I do think that if you look at communities like Linux, Drupal, et cetera, um, what you can do is, as a community come together, identify the core group, which is there today, I mean, we saw the awards. Um, there are a couple of people that are really major contributors and they will be for the foreseeable future. And their organizations where they work have a vested interest in continuing the Transmart core. So that group is there. And what we can do is make sure that that group um, continues to have the resources to work closely together and to work on, for example, code commit guidelines um, and APIs. Then the second thing is if we have that more modular um, um, architecture, then we can have multiple plugins, either open source or commercial, um, that would enrich the whole Transmart, and now I'm gonna use the word ecosystem. <laughs> uh, uh, he just wanted to get at you. Okay. The currency is the Yeah, no, what the currency is? Well, that is, um, um, both data and code, right? But I don't think it's necessary for Transmart Foundation to um, really start, you know, um, micromanaging this whole development process. I don't think that's the right way forward. It would prohibit um, the community spirit. Of course, Transmart Foundation could pull a couple of harmonies together um, and, and academic centers or other organizations around a specific topic and write an RFP. I could see that happen, but it has to be in the same guidelines. Like any company could do this. Let me give an example. Um, UI development was mentioned by Brian earlier. I can tell you it's very difficult to find funds to do uh, a UI revamp for Transmart. Like my development team is aching to do it, but I keep telling them, no, I cannot fund that. Trade doesn't want it. Um, none of our pharma customers want to pay for that, so we cannot work on improving the UI. But what I could imagine is that as we identify as a community that's important, that for example, Transmart Foundation um, pulls together a project on revamping the UI. You, you take um, Sanofi, are you interested? What do you want to invest? Pfizer, what do you want to invest? You know, go around and... Yeah, and then... <laughs> Exactly, and then you could do a specific project and then I know, put out an RFP to software vendors to do that development. I could see that happen, but you don't, I don't think it's, it would be a mistake to try to micromanage the whole Transmart development. That's my answer. Hold on, Jay, we're bringing you a microphone. And then EK. Jan Willem is still on deck. Oh, sorry, 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 Jan. My hunch is that for the time being, until we get code committee, the, the developers can get this API in place that the foundation is going to have to provide a strong element of coordination when it comes to technical contribution. Yeah. And that's a reality. And I, I don't think it's a bad reality. 
I, I don't think it is. And I don't think it needs micromanaging, but I think it's a strong element of coordination of the technical aspects. And we'll need to do that maybe forever, but certainly in the next year, that's going to be a strong element from the foundation until we get the API that we all envisioned yesterday in the, in the code committee meeting. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. And I agree on that. So I think the next step there would be to kick off a hackathon at the code committee with a small group, as we already discussed, actually, um, to work on the architecture and to lay out that roadmap and the specific activities that we're going to do to make sure that happens. Sounds like an action item there on the uh, roadmap. Yeah, yeah. good. Yeah, so I, I wanted to get back to your original question about um, uh, the, the brokering role that um, the Transmart Foundation could play in uh, in setting up new new projects. Eh? So I think that's an excellent idea, eh? and, and I, I could see uh, foresee that we would like to extend that a bit, and also to a more informal brokering role. Eh? So I ferry my second uh, case command that we don't want to have any micromanagement on the, on the roadmap. Eh? But a bit informal uh, coordination role on the on the roadmap is kind of missing. Eh? So it would be really great when you could uh, when you consider a new project that you could talk to someone who really knows what's going on in the community, mm -hmm. and 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 Good just point. to check whether there is a, a double work a double work going on, eh? so that you're duplicating the efforts of others. Eh? And and that's not going to work through a, uh, through a website eh? because everyone puts uh, puts some stuff on on the website and then forgets about it. Eh? But yeah, but, but you would like to know what's going on seriously before you take up a new, a new project, and and a brokering role there would very much be appreciated. Huh? Well, I definitely see that. I don't know who was responsible for the fourth C that we talked about over dinner, but I have a suspicion. Um, but I think one of the roles of the foundation is, in fact, trying to find ways to bring additional funding into the community to help fund some of this development and to keep things rolling. And I think that really fits that role. If we can do things collaboratively, I think we heard of a, a service provider doing that from a data curation perspective with what Thomson Reuters presented uh, yesterday, you know, is bring people together for a collaborative curation of content that people, you know, have a joint interest in. I think also from the development, if we have, you know, sets of features we can organize around. So I think we need to, you know, as a, as a community role, uh, think about how we can be effective in that and how we can bring things forward. Because I, one of the things I, I really take away from this is that it's this collaborative development nature of what we've done that is really the power of the community. And it's, it's not that we have one architect or one designer or that we have a whole community of people doing lots of different things and we just keep talking and working together and it all moves in a direction. You know, and the foundation sits here as sort of a catalyzing hub node to make sure that there's communication, that there's co cooperation. You know, if people want to be, there are a lot of people working on Transmart that aren't here and aren't represented here. Um, but the ones that are, are really interested in working together and collaborating. I see that as the role for that, for the foundation. And Keith, there was a, can I add quickly, yes, um, I think what Jan Willem said is practically the definition of the community manager, right? Yes. And you are hiring community manager for Europe as well. So, yeah. If you look at the Raspberry Pi Foundation, for example, they have one person that is always writing blogs, looking um, around at what are people doing in the Raspberry Pi, and taking photos of that. We need someone like that, basically, to show and, and um, constantly tell about all the cool things that people are doing at Transmart. Sometimes yeah. it's just that one key function that makes a product, you know, like uh -huh. when it just absolutely takes off. And I'll give you one really interesting anecdote uh, my tenure at Microsoft. Our first enterprise customer for the exchange email system was Boeing company. Uh -huh. And I could very clearly remember that day where our account manager went into Boeing, you know, we're going to seal the deal on the licenses of, of, of the first, you know, enterprise um, license of, of our exchange server in, in, within the Boeing Corporation. And then they, they came back to us and said, there was one thing that we wish we had. And we're like, what? Well, you know, we were really pushing our way to Lotus Nose, but look, you know, look at, look at, look at, look at, our, look at our infrastructure. It's completely heterogeneous. We have terminals, we have PCs, we have Macs. Is there a web interface for your email system? 
And the account manager was like, let me get back to you. And it was on a Thursday. And he runs back to the Microsoft campus. And I recalled like, hey, you know, we, we were all, we were all, at the time, we were also rolling out our first web server, IIS. And there was, a, there was this one developer sitting in some corner, some college kid that was just hired. He was playing around with a web service, and, and he created a UI for the Exchange server. And we go, that's it. And then, and then like, so we had our own internal hackathon over the weekend. And then on Monday, we said, yes, we do. <laughs> And that won the account, that won our multi-million dollar account for the Exchange web server. And awesome. to this very day, that's the number one uh, interface to the email web server is the, is the web, web portal, accessing, accessing email through the web. And that was just something that we just completely overlooked after spending millions of dollars on the development of this. It's just that one thing that changed the equation for us. So keep that in mind. Yeah, pretty much agree with us. I think it's the, when Keith's talking, Keith's talking about the micromanagement and avoid this, uh, I fully agree. I think it's very important. The reason we do the product roadmap, not different from 1.2, well, we put the spreadsheets, everybody get requirements, we voted, because that time, it's a good way to do this way. But that not necessarily mean is the only way we can do that. I mean, the reason we can achieve now today in you know, a much more, what I was called, is a democratic or more distributed way of thinking is because now we have a one point two at the base, which is a very good thing. I much prefer the, we run the open software spread. Let, let the flowers actually flow and grow freely. And then we need innovation from all the parts, like this kind of your Eureka moment. It's not gonna happen if we artificially put a lot of process on this impossible manager group. It's not gonna work. I inspired by his talk a lot. If I'm not listening to this talk, I was thinking differently. Mm -hmm. So what I think we have to do is make this foundation as a communication forum, yep. right? Let's the idea flow. People here are genius, most of them, right? So let's people flow. I don't think we have any means to please the free thinking. It's impossible. Perhaps it's a case of making the features known, yeah, right, and seeing what sticks, and then yeah. making sure the yeah. entire you 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 pick you pick the best yeah. flowers, right? But you have to let them to grow first. Right. So some point. We got to really think about developing 1.2 for a uniform base is very different because this one we want a solid, right? We want something we can have a base. But now we start thinking about what is the right thing to do? What is the everybody wanted to do? So this we need a lot of communication rather than too much process. I actually agree with it fully. Yeah, maybe Florian, you want to chime in on this as well. I mean. There is this is let the flowers be oh, I'm looking on where's the plugins and the core we have to manage. I, I really have nothing else to add. I mean, it, you said everything and, and, and you can confirm it as well. It, it, that's the way to go, I guess. Mm -hmm. I just want to add a little comment on Iki's talk. I mean, on the meeting, Paris has said something very, very um, important for all of us that there is no transsmart for the foundation there is no transsmart for Atrix. we have like only one transsmart and we could feel this on the release of the 1.2 version i would like to remember that and make it further for the next versions that there will be a unified transsmart version right no i think that's been critical is bringing everything to one one base and you know one of the things that people have done is like ubuntu with things they have sort of a development version and a long-term supported version. You know, that's something we could consider is having you know, a really stable version that we're gonna sit on and it's gonna be tested, maintained, supported, made more robust over time. And then another branch where people are really you know, doing whatever it is that they think is the right thing to do. And then we pick, exactly. I, I, that seems like a, a reasonable comment, concept to me. 
Great. Let me see. Any other uh, questions or comments? I know we had one on the phone. Uh, it basically was uh, focusing back again on the, the data loading and data curation as being one of the, the stumbling blocks to getting things in. Um, and I think that's, that speaks as well to sort of a, a, a datathon, hackathon approach, which is getting stuff in, making it work. Um, it might be interesting to have some sort of hackathon on, on ETL, you know, where we're looking at real new methods and new means. I know we have, you know, Elevate, I was talking with the, the guys there, they've got some new ideas and technology around, you know, more rapid data loading and curation. Uh, that might be an interesting concept for a hackathon over the next 12 months as well. Okay. Let me see here. I think we're, we've ran out of time a bit ago. Oh, yep, we did. So, uh, did there anybody, anybody else want to make a comment or kick in anything here? Anybody want to make a, a summary of, of what Paul they've has seen? Something there. Paul? Anyone else? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> on, on this slide, I'd like to make a comment when I see data models with an S and you create additional data models for all. I, I, I've integrated RNA-seq, all exome sequencing data, all genome sequencing in the same data model, in the yeah. I2B2 data model, because I want to do fine-grained correlation with phenotypic data. If you don't want to use I2B2, fine, but use the same data model. With, it's the S, my issue. Having an issue, because if there's this, an S, oh my it God. means different databases, and the connection between all of them will be hard-coded and by certain use cases, and you won't have everything. I've oh. chosen everything in I2B2, so that's why I was able to make all those different kind of correlations. And the, having an S, I think that's an issue for... Yep. Paul, I think in this case, um, I am really coming from the user's end, okay? So this is what I would like to do, to be able to cross these different data types and index on individual level, okay, from both I, ends. I think Whether, what I heard is that that's what you've been able to do by adopting an existent data model. Oh, okay, never mind. <laughs> that's, because that's what I, I, because I use the same data model. That's why it worked. So, Paul, we've been arguing on this topic more than a year now, right? Oh, and, more than that. You know, we will never come to uh, the same stance. But I think the great thing about Transmart is you are able to use Transmart in that way. I envision also other ways, you know, building the data models for genomics data in there and doing more advanced analysis. And we're both part of this community. Yes. So, great. <laughs> But that's what I've been repeating. Everyone can use it the way he wants. And yeah. I've repeated that many times. But my, my but, concern... Uh, uh, we need to expose these data models and make sure that we're clear about them and that we don't get kind of, uh, you know, noise in the system because we don't understand. Them. Well, so I, We really know. need to expose this more. Right. Yeah. We need to expose the functionalities that are being utilized or not being utilized and kind of rectify some of the historic problems there. It's a, good, it's a good conversation to have, and we're going to continue to have it for a while. And I can see that uh, Houseman's got some ideas on the subject. Well, well the first one, I think both Kays and Paul are right, as always. Um, what Paul is really talking about, you know, he isn't talking about data models. He's talking about semantic models and things like that. If he was to, say, model RNA-seq, we could share how we model it in I2B2, which is not a data model. Right, it's a it's hierarchy, a, yeah. it's a terminology, whatever the hell is really an I2B2. Um, and that probably should be somewhere on the map of things we think about if we're yep. trying to share our work, especially if we want to be able to have an addressable analysis that understands RNA-seq data. We need a consistent way we are putting it in that schema. So that's fantastic. Um, in the other side, for genomic data and, and a lot of these other pieces, I see the benefit of having things that are in their native structured form and be able to put bioinformatics pipelines that really know how to crunch against a VCF file and not have to like 
retrain you know, Galaxy to understand ITV2. That's, a, that's an impossible project. I don't want to sign up for that. <laughs> um, so we still need to structure data the way we expect it <laughs> right. in these other tools. And so case is the case <laughs> and so suggestion we need both. of adopting GATK and Broad is, uh, for, for the VCF is the, uh, you know, very sensible. And, and you know, the Global Alliance now has over 300 members, and they've uh, you know, got uh, David Altshuler and people like this who are chairing these committees, yeah. and um, Hausler and so on. So we would be very uh, ill-advised to go too far astray from that, which is along so, the lines of what you're saying. So, uh, and I do have one more suggestion, which is because I don't just live here. I also live in the OMOP world and some of the other groups that are okay. doing open projects. OMOP in its last version stopped short of the molecular models and the biobanking stuff and those mm -hmm. sorts of things. It will point. not in the next version. So when you get to the, you know, in version of OMOP, which is going to be like a, a year, year and a half out, we probably want to think about some convergence because we don't want five different versions of how we handle RNA-seq data. That's not way, going to I serve really, anybody. This is a very important point. I had this listed out as an element in the content committee, and uh, you know the Reagan Udall people are very, you know, kind of tuned in, and the FDA people are obviously tuned into this. So it's a discontinuity having to do with the fact that it's over on. You know, kind of pharmacovigilance and data safety and adverse events and a lot of, you know, it's not, uh, you know, kind of central to discovery and, you know, first in the human translation and that kind of thing. But it's something we need to keep on our screen. I think that's a very good thing. Let's get Mata and Shumi to our next transform meeting. <laughs> yep. No, I think these are all excellent, uh, excellent discussion points and comments. And I think one of the, the great things about this community is the diversity of views and then how we can open up those that diversity of views and then come back and agree on a path forward yeah and that i think is really what is the strength of our community so it's fantastic i want to thank the panelists for catalyzing the discussion uh thank uh the the group here for participating in that discussion in particular all of you i believe we have a, a time now for lunch um looks like lunch is already back there waiting for us and then we reconvene at one o'clock um so we have really from good. one till three we got a number of things to go through uh, but we'll see you back at, at one o'clock